Asgard. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you your boy with the blaze. Oh, great introduction, ETA. Great job. Now get the fuck over here. Such gratitude. Um, good. Good. I'd like to tell you about 5G. Hey, don't say any of that shit. I know what you're like. Coronavirus is Hey. Yeah. Hi, I am your boy with the bellies. Belizzardy blaze. My name is Simon. Danny has written us a script. Most incredible art heists. How exciting. I love heist movies. Whenever I'm at home and my wife is like, I don't know, out with friends or visiting her parents, I'll always go to Netflix. And I'll always either watch reruns of Star Trek or heist movies. I don't know why, I've seen Ocean's Eleven like six times. <laughs> anyway, let's get into it. I watch Flat Earth videos. Danny writes us a script. I read it. Sam adds some memes. ETA tries to shut his mouth about COVID. Let's do it. What's the most expensive thing you've ever stolen? It definitely wasn't really high-priced software. That's for sure. I would never pirate high-priced software from anyone ever. I'm sure Simon will make out that he hasn't stolen anything in his life because he was raised properly and taught from a very young age that shoplifters go to hell. No, I, I'm probably going to hell. To be honest, I was never into stealing. Although I have to confess that I did once steal a massive bag of pick and mix sweets from a branch of Woolworths in Rotherham. And I know I'm pronouncing it wrong, but I don't care. I remember a friend of mine's mom, like when we were kids at primary school or whatever, she was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we were buying pick and mix and she was tasting them in the store. And I'm like, is that okay? And she's like, oh, it's okay. I don't know about that. And this was a very middle class woman. I hadn't intended to steal them at all. Me and a mate had decided to live like kings and blow all of our pocket money in Woolworths, scooping jumbo helpings of foam bananas, flying saucers, candy necklaces, strawberry pencils, and cherry lips into two plastic bags. Candy necklaces were the shittest of all of these. It's like they tasted nasty, they hurt your teeth. Candy necklaces blow. All of those other ones are delicious. I'm not eating sugar at the moment. I mean, or I'm eating like much reduced sugar as I try to be a healthy person towards the end of, until the end of the year. My mouth is watering and I'm not a big sugary person anyway, but now I want all that sh because I can't have it. But it was close to Christmas time and the queues to get served were ridiculously long. We waited patiently in line for 15 minutes but started to get a bit frustrated when we noticed that the queues just didn't seem to be moving at all. Danny, if you're walking out of the store with this and saying that you deliberately didn't steal, you didn't deliberately steal it, you did deliberately steal it. <laughs> but that's okay. Although Woolworths is now out of business. So uh, maybe Danny's shoplifting finally put them out of business. It, it didn't. So we just sort of gave each other a knowing look, which when roughly translated would go something along the lines of, F this for a game of soldiers, let's just scarper with all of the sweets. <laughs> this for a game of soldiers sounds like something I would say combined with something my grandmother would say. Now it just so happens that a very wise and knowledgeable older friend had only recently informed me that most shoplifters go about their business in entirely the wrong way. They skulk around in the shadows, looking incredibly dodgy as they try and discreetly slip stuff under their coats without anybody noticing. My older mate reckons that this was no good at all. A more effective method is to just brazenly walk out of the shop as if you own the place, clearly carrying the stolen goods in your hands as if they already belong to you. I agree, if you're gonna steal just walk in, grab it and walk. What does this have to do with art heists? This is like Danny's lame shoplifting. As it turns out, he was right. We walked out of that branch of Woolworths with our heads held high, swinging about the bag of pick and mix sweets as we made our loud and confident exit. Woolworths entered administration about 25 years later, but I'm pretty sure it had nothing to do with us. Yeah, I think Woolworths entered administration because I, I, I don't really know what they were for. They just seemed to sell a bunch of random crap that no one wants. I think I went to Woolworths maybe like twice in my life and it was probably entirely to buy sweets. I often think that art thieves would be wise to adopt this policy. Instead of sneaking about at night in disguise as a caretaker or figuring out how to jump through all the laser beam security centers, you're better off just ripping the painting down from the wall in broad daylight and in full view of a packed museum and then just calmly walking out of the building, only giving a cheeky wink to the receptionist. I'm fairly sure that some art heists have been like this, where it's just been like, yeah, boom, 
ultimate confidence. I kind of admire it, although it would make a more boring movie. I'm not sure if Business Blaze can fully endorse this method. We can, but we don't take any responsibility for your actions. But if you decide to give it a try, please let us know how you get it on. It'll be Business Blaze's first interview. Although, we'll have to disguise your voice, I guess. In fact, some of the greatest art heists of all time were indeed quite simple, but with a few whistles and bells and alarms, although others got surprisingly overcomplicated. Exhibit A, Mona Lisa, stolen in 1911. An obvious place to begin would be with the world's most famous and certainly overrated painting. Yeah, I mean, the Mona Lisa, I've never seen it. I've been to the Louvre. And I don't think I even saw the Mona Lisa, probably because I didn't want to queue, and I've seen it on the internet, and it's, I don't know, it's okay, it's not that great. I saw Dali's um, uh, A Perception of Time, the Melting Clocks painting, the super famous one. Oh, f what's it called? And it was really small, but it was still awesome, because, I don't know, that's an amazing painting. The Mona Lisa, uh, uh, it's okay. It reminds me of that song from The Lonely Island. Mona Lisa, you're an overrated piece of sh**. I still find it hard to believe that this portrait painting by a man who clearly you couldn't even do eyebrows has managed to attract so much acclaim and fame. I'm on the same page with you, Danny. It's just okay. But the strange thing about the Mona Lisa is that it was the 1911 theft from the Louvre in Paris which made the picture go viral in the first place. And the thief wasn't even in it for the money. He was just doing his patriotic duty, allegedly. Yeah, it's gonna be really hard to sell the Mona Lisa. <laughs> it's like quite famous. Be like, yeah, can I really buy that? I mean, Half a billion dollars or how much the Mona Lisa would sell for is expensive, but... And you could show it to no one. <laughs> So you gotta be like really into art to just have it like in a secret vault somewhere and just look at it. Originally painted in the very early 16th century by the Italian Renaissance artist Leonardo da Vinci, the Mona Lisa certainly became a well-known piece over the course of the next 300 years and, been ha and has been hanging in a Paris museum since 1797. But it was a simply executed theft from the Louvre in 1911 which generated headlines around the world and led to the piece becoming the most widely recognized and most visited painting of all time. Oh my god, I've just remembered one of my favorite heist movies. The Thomas Crown Affair. Mwah! Mwah! That's a great movie. The Italian petty criminal Vincenzo Perugia had moved to Paris in 1908 and had actually secured a job at the Louvre installing protective glass casings for the most valuable paintings. There are differing accounts as to how he managed to casually wander out of the Louvre with the Mona Lisa without anybody noticing. The most widely told tale is that Vincenzo spent the night before the theft hiding in a closet in the museum. Early the next morning, just as the gallery was reopening, he removed the painting from the frame and concealed it under the long white smock that he was wearing. Legend has it that he came across an unexpected obstacle when he was faced with a locked door on his journey out of the museum. Dude, you just expect all the doors to be open. It's like, ah, oh, no, the door's locked. I didn't think of this. Ah, uh, but a plumber just happened to be wandering by. Assuming that Vincenzo was a fellow worker, the plumber helpfully opens the door with his own key. Yeah, I'd do that. Like, Whenever someone comes to my apartment building and they're like behind me, I'm always like, yeah, yeah, of course, come right in. I'd go up to my apartment and they're like, yes, of course, you must be doing something. Are you here to like measure my gas? <laughs> Gay! Oh, I'm a security hazard. Uh, it's debatable how much of this is completely true, although the general gist of the story is about right. Vincenzo himself, I'm gonna stop. Vincenzo himself later claimed to police that he didn't camp overnight in a closet. He just turned up early in the morning dressed in the same sort of smock as all the other employees. And it doesn't seem very feasible that a man of his short stature would have been able to hide the hefty painting underneath his smock. It's more likely that he simply draped the smock over the painting and tucked it under his arm as he made his exit. Did he at least cover it up where he's like, no, 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 I'm taking it for, uh restoration. So this could have been an early pioneering example of the just walk out as if you own the place strategy. Vincenzo took the Mona Lisa back to his apartment in Paris where it remained undetected for a couple of years. <laughs> Holy sh as the world's press went into a frenzy with reports on the search for Leonardo da Vinci's lost masterpiece. Early suspects included Spanish artist Pablo Picasso, holy sh Pablo, and poet playwright oh, G Guillaume Apollinaire. Maybe. The latter of whom was even arrested, but there wasn't a shred of evidence to support any allegations against either of them. Okay, so why were they arrested? The game, I think I made a video about. I made so many videos that I forget. The game was up for Vincenzo in 1913 when he made contact with an art dealer in Florence called Alfredo Jerry. Under the clever new pseudonym Leonardo Vincenzo, 
Very clear. Is that just his name reversed? Or is it Leonardo da Vinci with Vincenzo, his actual surname? Dude, if you're coming up with a pseudonym, is it really so smart to use your... Oh, it's his first name. Okay, whatever. Who cares? The art thief offered to sell the Mona Lisa to Alfredo for 500,000 lira. Uh, he traveled to Florence on the train, carrying the painting in a trunk with a hidden false bottom. Upon meeting Alfredo, he was persuaded to leave the painting with the art dealer for expert examination. But in fact, Alfredo took this time to contact the police and Vincenzo. Vincenzo was swiftly arrested. However, it has to be said that Vincenzo got off pretty lightly. He claimed that he was acting out of patriotic duty. So why did he try to sell it, dude? Returning the Italian painting to his rival home after it was stolen by Napoleon a century earlier. All right, so just take it to your home. Don't leave it in Paris, in, in your apartment in Paris, hidden for two years, and then try to sell it for like 500,000 lira. I guess that's a lot of money. I don't really know. In fact, it got his history a bit wrong, though. Leonardo da Vinci had sold the painting to the to the French king, Francis I, as early as 1516. So, this just sounds like an excuse. Like, why do you see the Mona Lisa? It wasn't for money. I was uh, returning it to its rightful home in Italy. It's like, why do you steal that money? I was returning it to its rightful home, my pockets. After that, it became the rightful property of the French Republic, although it did spend a bit of time in Napoleon's bedroom following the French Revolution. What a legend. <laughs> it was returned to its permanent home in the Louvre in 1797. It could be argued that Vincenzo's patriotic claims were more than a little dubious anyway. If he was really doing all of this for the benefit of his country, why was he trying to flog the stolen painting to an art dealer for 500,000 lira? Nevertheless, the court showed leniency, and he only served seven months in prison, after which he was celebrated in some Italian circles as a national hero. Still, he single-handedly managed to turn the Mona Lisa into the most famous painting of all time, even if he raised a couple of invisible eyebrows along the way. But a bum bum Last video I mentioned how I was doing that less aggressively because my back hurts. My back still hurts. Um, so, bear with me. I'm gonna blaze, but gently. And I'm also gonna roam a little while I blaze because, you know, it is what it is. Uh, exhibition B, The Scream. Stolen in 1994 and 2004. I remember when it was stolen in 2004. It was a big deal. Now this is more like it. Edward Munches. I did realize his name was Munch. Oh, 1893 composition The Scream is a much more relatable piece of work, depicting a typical morning walk down to the shops to buy some cigarettes and scratch cards. <laughs> All right then, Danny, whatever you're into. <laughs> and it's so good that it was stolen twice, kind of. I believe there's more than one painting of The Scream, so I guess it was not, maybe it was returned and stolen again, but maybe there were two of them and they were stolen. The thing is, Norwegian painter Edward Munch created several different versions of his masterpiece, I'm a genius, including two versions in paint and two in pastel. Leonardo da Vinci would have learned a thing or two about this virtuous work. Imagine how much more money he would have made if it churned out a few more Mona Lisas on those wet Sunday afternoons. He might have even figured out how to do eyebrows. The theft of the original 1893 painting took place in February 1994 at the National Gallery in Oslo on the very same day as the opening of the Winter Olympics in Lillehammer. To make room for the Olympic-themed festivities taking place at the gallery, the painting had been temporarily moved down to a less secure second-story floor. The whole operation took approximately 50 seconds. Four masked gunmen stuck up a ladder up to the second story, climbed in through the window, overwhelmed the security guard, nabbed the painting and then made a hasty exit from the building. They left behind a cheeky note which said, a thousand thanks for the bad security. Oh, it's like a movie, I love it. Don't be thieves. I mean, unless you're legendary. Oh, not a guarantee, d d I'm not endorsing that. Stop right there, criminal scum. Nobody breaks the law on my watch. The gallery soon received a ransom note for a million dollars, but was never given any proof that the demand was genuine. The anti-abortion anti movement laid claims that they were behind the theft, and they would only return the painting if an anti-abortion film was broadcast to the nation. This was ultimately dismissed as a hoax. It sounds like a hoax. Also, come on guys, that's, don't do that. Don't do that, you're gonna get in trouble either way. <laughs> However, it only took three months for the painting to be recovered following a sting operation carried out in conjunction with the British police and the Getty Museum. The fragile but largely undamaged painting was tracked down to a hotel in Arsgard Strand, just 40 miles of Oslo. Arsgard. <laughs> One of the ringleaders was a guy called Pop Palenga, who had previous form with art theft and seemed to have a particular penchant for the work of Munch. He previously served time for a 1988 theft of another work by Munch called The Vampire. It's like, dude, you're gonna be like number one on their suspect list. It was like, yeah, what do you go to prison for? Stealing one artist's paintings. I really love his paintings. Someone stole the screen. Maybe it's Paul. 
probably Paul. During the, during the search for the stolen screen, Paul Lenger appeared to be toying with the police, taking out a classified advertisement in the birth section of the local press, which announced the, that his new baby son had arrived with a scream. Dude, what are you doing? This makes you look guilty as hell. The R villain was originally sentenced to six and a half years in prison for his role in the caper, but was released on appeal when it was revealed that the British agents had illegally entered Norway under false identities. Oh no, guys, you made an error. But he was still destined to serve a lengthy prison sentence following a string of further art thefts. In Norway, don't they have like a maximum time you could go to prison? Because that dude who shot all those guys on the island, isn't he gonna get released someday? And it's like, dude, he murdered like a hundred people. It's like, what the f Norway? As recently as 2015, he pled guilty to the stealing of five Push Wagner paintings from the Fine Art Gallery in Acker Brieg in Oslo. I'm sorry about the pronunciations there. I, I, I don't care. After carelessly leaving behind his wallet containing his ID during the theft. Oh, dude, come on. It's like, we know. You, you're like, if, if there was a random wallet left behind by a regular thief, you'd be like, yeah, yeah, I lost my wallet in the museum. Where if it's, it's like, no, 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 it's the guy who's famous for stealing paintings to be like, oh, he's going to prison. I'm beginning to think that this guy was just craving attention. Yeah, dude. Uh, the 1893 version of The Scream was back in its rightful place, but later, the 1910 version of the painting was stolen from Norway's Munch Museum in 2004. Munch Museum sounds like a, a place for snacks. Ah, uh, the cooperation wasn't quite so swift and smooth. In fact, some witnesses say it was downright clumsy, with the two mask thieves actually dropping the stolen paintings several times throughout the robbery. <laughs> Guys, I mean, art thefts in movies are so cool and slick and, you know, George Clooney's doing stuff. Here it's like, what's going on? Or Piers Brosnan. I don't think Piers Brosnan or George Clooney have ever dropped anything in their lives. Like, if I saw George Clooney stumble, I'd be like, oh my god, the world is falling apart. Two paintings were stolen this time, uh, along with the scream, the, but the butterfingered art thieves also targeted another of Edward Munch's works, Madonna. The pair had a combined value of $90 million. They chose to carry out the theft in the middle of the day when the museum was packed, threatening staff and visitors with guns while physically holding two of the security guards at gunpoint. One of the witnesses pointed out how surprisingly easy it seemed to be to remove the paintings from the walls. The thieves simply had to pull quite hard on them for the paintings to come loose. What are you gonna do? Like, you're not gonna super glue them to the wall. Oh, yeah, I suppose you could, like, really bolt them to the wall. But I mean, at some point, the paintings are gonna be in a frame, and then it's like, are you bolting the canvas to the frame? I mean, I don't know. Or just put it behind a big glass case. It's okay. I'm really surprised when you go to museums and art galleries, and it's like all of these like super ancient paintings, and it's like, there's no glass in front of it, and I'm like, what if I sneezed on that sh Or what if I was just some crazy and I'm like, yeah, stab it. And it's like, that painting was worth $5 million. Yeah, I yeah, know, I'm crazy. And you, people just walk into museums. You know, crazy people can go to museums and f*** all sorts of sh**. Uh, what's that about? And why does it happen more often? I mean, I don't want it to happen more often, but it kind of surprises me there aren't more crazy people. It surprises me that people can be trusted so much. Despite a bystander taking photographs and videos of the thieves making their getaway in a waiting vehicle, and the city government of Oslo offering a reward of 2 million Norwegian kroner for information leading to the recovery of the two stolen paintings, the scent went cold for a couple of years. Although the police never revealed exact details of the eventual recovery in 2006, the two slightly damaged paintings were found and six suspects faced trial. Three of them were acquitted, while the other three were sentenced to between four and eight years in prison and ordered to pay 750 million kroner in compensation to the city of Oslo. Where, where, where are these guys are thieves? Where are they going to get their money other than thieving? Hey Siri, how much is 750 million kroner in dollars? I'll tell you, Simon. It's about 50p. The mysterious case of the secret recovery of the paintings had led to some speculation that the thieves weren't even remotely interested in their value, and the whole operation had been planned to simply distract police from another investigation into the murder of a Norwegian police officer. So the police are just distracted and they're like, yeah, 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 because we're really busy with the paintings, we're just not going to investigate the murder of our colleague. It's like, that doesn't seem likely. It seems like the police have, you know, a lot of resources and, and they'd be pretty motivated by the murder of one of their friends. Whatever the true story, the thieves may have lived to regret letting that picture of the screen slip through their greasy fingers. Later in 2012, another 1895 pastel version of the screen was auctioned at Sotheby's in London where it was snapped up by an American businessman for a record-breaking $120 million. God damn! There's a shop in my village that sells high-quality prints of the screen for about four quid. Yeah, 
there, Danny, but they're not the original, are they? $120 million. God damn. Exhibit C, two Renoirs and a Rembrandt, stolen in 2000. This has got to go down as one of the most dramatic and explosive art heists in history. In December 2000, three gunmen wandered into the National Museum in Sweden with their eyes on no less than three different works of art. A rather drab self-portrait by Rembrandt and two pieces by Renoir, Conversation with the Gardener and Young Parisian. Fascinatingly titled Renoir, great job. At a push, I might have been persuaded to hang Conversations with the Gardener up on my living room wall it looks like this but i probably would have regulated relegated the other two plate to the bathroom or the cellar they look like this thank you sam i certainly wouldn't have considered splashing out about 47 million dollars for the set of all three which was the established value at the time at first glance the theft seemed remarkably simple and crude three guys in balaclavas this is always what happens it's just regular thieving they go in they take the paintings and they leave there's no like clever like Catherine Zeta Jones flying around with lasers everywhere and all of that. Shit. I wish there was. It'd be a lot more interesting. I'm sorry that real life art heists are, are so f boring. Maybe I could entertain you with some 5G dangers. No! The lizard people are doing. Three guys in balaclavas walked into a waterfront museum, waving around big machine guns at anyone who dared to look at them a bit funny, and then removed their chosen paintings from the walls before making a swift getaway in a motorboat moored alongside the museum. But the heist was far more elaborate than it looked. The thieves had planted car bombs across, oh, I've heard of this, across town in Stockholm, which they detonated by remote control while they were in the museum, causing a massive distraction for the police, who were naturally prioritizing two huge explosions over a few old paintings getting nicked. The Police attempting to respond to either the car bombs or the art heist failed, uh, faced an additional problem when they tried to get to the scene. All the tires of their vehicles had been slashed by the gang beforehand. This is actually pretty good. We're getting into more movie territory, Danny. I like it. So, as cars were randomly blowing up across town and the police were stalled in vehicles that couldn't get anywhere, the gang were able to carry out the art theft in a fairly casual and confident manner. They probably even had time to grab a quick coffee. But they didn't get long to enjoy their victory. Within less than a month, ten arrests were made eventually leading to eight of the men receiving jail sentences of between two and six years each. The sentences seem quite light to me. Maybe they'd received longer jail time if they'd chosen slightly better paintings to steal. Yeah, these guys got two to six years. They were blowing up car bombs and, like, interfering with the police. That seems more like, you know, in America they'd be executed. The paintings took a little longer to recover, but by 2005, all had been found undamaged. The recovery of the Rembrandt self-portrait was actually a complete fluke. The Stockholm police had been working on a totally unrelated drug sting and were taken by surprise when the painting was offered for a trade. But that goes to show just how difficult it can be to shift a painting after you've gone to the trouble of nicking it, and sometimes it makes you wonder why they bother. I assume because it's like, let's say I'm some like super villain billionaire, and I'm like, okay, I, I want to see, like, the scream. But, you know, and me and my super billionaire evil friends are going to go around for dinner and look at this painting on the wall that, you know, no one else can see now. That's why. I imagine they do it on commission. Or at least that would be sensible, because otherwise, how do you sell it? It's all very well saying that a painting has a value of around $20 million, but it's not like you can just shove it on eBay after you've stolen it. The painting will very quickly become too hot to handle. Which is a show that Netflix, too hot to handle? They're like, Simon, 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 why haven't you watched Too Hot to Handle yet? And I'm like, Netflix, have you ever seen me watch reality TV on your platform? Especially this piece of shit. Oh yeah, we're the worst, yeah. And I'm like, why do you want me to watch this? F off. I'm just going to watch old episodes of Star Trek and heist movies. Your best bet is to find a rich and slightly weird private art dealer who would need to keep the stolen painting hidden away from public view forever to avoid the risk of anyone snitching. But then what's the point of spending millions of dollars on a painting that you can never show off to anyone? You're probably better off stealing really big crates of squeezy cheese. Unless you just really love art. I would say the people who have the painting stolen and never show them to anyone and just have them in a vault where they look at them are probably bigger art fans than the guys spending $120 million on one. Because one, it's like, well, yeah, I really like the art, but also, you know, when my rich friends come round, I just remind them that I'm richer than them by having a $120 million painting on the wall. Um, so there's a whole other reason to buy it. 
But if you're just having it stolen for your own personal enjoyment, I probably think you're a bigger fan of art than the other guy who actually paid for it. Exhibit D, the Duke of Wellington, stolen in 1961. Finally, here's my favorite art heist story, which may lack the explosive drama of the previous theft, but it wins top points for sheer madness. In 1961, a portrait of the Duke of Wellington, painted by the Spanish artist Francisco Goya in 1814, was stolen from the National Gallery in London. The quite remarkable thing about the theft is that it appeared to have been carried out by a grand 17 stone disabled British pensioner who was trying to make a point about TV licenses. <laughs> All right. Earlier this year, the, everyone, when I mentioned TV licenses before, the comments were like, What is a TV license? And I answered like three of them, and then no one else reads the comments. So they'll just post without looking at the comments and see if the question has already been done. So I was like, it's, I just started replying to all of them. It's just like a license to kill, but for TV. It makes no sense, but I didn't know what else to say. A TV license is something that exists in the UK that basically allows you to watch, or, you know, doesn't allow you to watch, but it's, if you don't have one, you'll get in trouble for watching TV, but it supports the BBC, which isn't advert funded. There's no adverts on it, I think. I don't care. And they say they have these magical machines which can detect you and that they, they, they can't. Earlier that same year, the painting of the Duke of Wellington had gone up for auction at Sotheby's and the New York art dealer Charles Reitzman had put in a bid of £140,000 for the masterpiece. Wow, that's a lot cheaper than all the other stuff. But this sparked outrage from British art lovers who felt strongly that the painting shouldn't be allowed to leave the country. So the UK government quickly scrambled around and found the funds for a matching bid, ensuring that the painting could now hang for the first time in the National Gallery in London. Well, if those people don't want it to leave so bad, why aren't they paying? Why aren't they paying for it? Why do tax dollars have to, tax pounds, have to go towards this? That sounds like some right bullshit right there. But this move from the government seemed to enrage a retired bus driver called Kempton Bunton. He felt very strongly that people on modest incomes should be given a lot more help in paying for their wildly expensive TV licenses, which back then were about four pounds a year. It's like a hundred something pound these days. Or it was when I last had one. It might not sound like much, but that was half a week's wages for Kempton back when he worked on the buses. So it was quite a lot to fork out in one go, especially considering that everything was black and white and rubbish back in those days and only fools and horses hadn't been invented yet. Only fools and horses is really overrated though. It's it's not very funny. Kempton's point was that while low-income families were struggling to get the money together for TV licenses and facing aggressive prosecution if they couldn't afford to pay, I think they just had a fine. The UK got, uh, while the UK government was happily splashing around thousands of pounds, hundreds of thousands of pounds, on paintings of a podgy, rosy-cheeked bloke in a military uniform. Dude, I mean, I'm not gonna steal the painting, but I'm with you on this one. F that. So 19 days after the Duke of Wellington first arrived in the National Gallery, Kempton decided to steal it in order for ransom. He'd heard that the fancy electronic security systems of the gallery were always turned off in the early morning to allow cleaners to do their stuff. Is that really true? And he'd just heard it, like on the street. Uh, so that was the moment he climbed in through the toilet window, prized the painting off the wall, and made his escape through the same toilet window completely undetected. That's incredible. Shortly afterwards, the Reuters news agency received a ransom note which revealed that the painting would be returned to the government if it agreed to donate £140,000 to a new charity which would help poorer people pay their TV licenses. The request was completely ignored. Yeah, dude, the government doesn't negotiate with thieves. I mean, maybe it does, I don't really know. They always say, like, we don't negotiate with terrorists. But I'm like, that you do. <laughs> Yeah, it's called politics and diplomacy. Or is that just something in the movies? I don't know. It wasn't long before Kempton Bunt had conceded that his cunning plan may have not worked. He had, and he handed himself into the police and returned the painting, minus the frame. <laughs> so, oh, that's a nice frame. Uh, and funnily enough, it was the missing frame that earned him the prison time. His defense team successfully argued that he never enforced intended to keep the painting, and that he couldn't be found guilty of theft as he made the effort to quickly return the picture of his own free will. Uh, what? But Kempton was sentenced to three months in the slammer for failing to return the frame. And it was this case that led directly to a new section of the 1968 Theft Act, which made it an offence to remove any object on display to the public without authority. Fifty years on from Kempton's ill-fated campaign, the UK TV licence fee, now priced at £157 a year, thank you Danny, continues to ignite controversy in the UK. The BBC just very recently announced that they'd scrapped plans to offer free licences for viewers aged 75 or over. And you can't help thinking that the very concept of a TV licence has become increasingly irrelevant bearing in mind that it only funds the BBC and everyone else has switched over to Netflix anyway. Yeah, I mean, it does sound pointless. I have a TV and they have a, check li a TV license in the Czech Republic where I live as well or like an equivalent of it and I'm like, no, I'm not paying that. And they're like, you have to legally declare that you won't watch TV and it's like, I'm not watching TV. I watch Netflix, uh, Amazon Prime and I play Xbox. That's what I do on the TV. I don't watch public TV. 
and I'm not paying your license. I think we need another man of Kempton Burton's Bunton's caliber to help raise awareness by stealing an absolute load of paintings from a major British gallery. Whoa, whoa, we're not encouraging that, Danny, are we? We're not. Allegedly. Uh, and proper good paintings too. Maybe something nice by Vincent van Gogh. Or oh, this time there'll be no it's Vincent van Gogh. Don't be like, it's Vincent van Gogh. Not in the UK. And in Dutch it's like, Gogh. Uh, this time there'll be no sneaking through the toilet windows, no machine guns, and no blowing up random cars at the other end of town. All we need to walk in, all we need to do is walk in and walk out like we own the place. This has been Business Blaze. Thank you for watching. If you liked this video, smash that like button. If you didn't like this video, smash that dislike button. ETA, thank you for being here today. You've been less involved in today's video. I'm a little bit sad, but not that sad. Um, thank you to Danny for writing the script. Thank you for Sam for adding the memes. And I will see you next time. It was an inside job. Gah. <laughs>